text to a Christmas text today and, and preach on Christmas, but we are going to do that next Sunday. So, so I, I also want to finish the book of Titus, which we are on the very last time in this book here. So uh, we're going to persevere on Titus one more week here, finish him up, and then we're, Christmas is here and we'll, we'll be hearing some of the account of Jesus' birth next week. We are to the end of Titus there, so uh, we're going to pick it up at verse 9 and read it to the very last verses of that. It's cha Titus chapter 3, beginning at verse 9. Let's, let's just drop back to verse 8 there first. The, the, this saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychius to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let all our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you, Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. And that is the end of Titus. Let's pray. Would you, uh, God in heaven, uh, speak to us through these closing comments too. And, uh, and energize us as your people to live in the right way through even these uh, final comments here in this book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, after you've preached all the way through this book and there's a lot of things that we've, uh, we've learned and, and, and grown in, we, we've talked about leadership in the church, we, we've talked about living in the church, and in this third chapter we've talked about living in a culture which is a pagan and, and, and unchristian, which it certainly was there, uh, then, then Paul comes to these final comments and and. You're tempted to just read over them quick, shut the Bible, and be done. You know, uh, it's, you know you, you, we, we have to get out of the mentality that, uh, you know how we write letters. Sometimes we write letters, and then at the end we just throw in the kitchen sink, right? You know, oh, this and that, that, and, and P.S. about this. And, and, you know, most people could probably stop reading our letters about two-thirds of the way through. They've heard what you really wanted to say, and those were just extraneous comments. And sometimes we would read a Bible book like that, and we'd think, well, are these just extraneous con uh, comments? I mean, after all, you have to end the letter somehow, right? So, uh, so is Paul just kind of winding down? But we remember, he is the apostle, and, and he uh, is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he writes the, this letter and the other letters that he wrote for the New Testament. And so all the seemingly slowing down comments have some merit in them. There's something that he's trying to bring across even at the last, in the last few verses of this. And the way I'm looking at it is, is Paul is describing as he closes this book Two kinds of teams in the world, and especially that, that, that the church has to watch out for. There is a, a team of, of people in the world that divide and destroy. And then there's another team of people who build up and, and edify and, and, uh, and progress together. And Paul's warning about these two things, or he's speaking about them in these final comments. He says, 
Now, we've talked about the church extensively, and we've talked about even the world around us, and we've talked about the gospel. But in closing, I want to remind you then uh, of, of this very real reality, which he picks up in verse 9, that there are people who wish to divide and, and destroy the church. So he says in verse 9 then, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, discussions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. The people who, one of the groups of people who want to destroy the, destroy the church are kind of quasi-theologians. And they want to they, they, they want to hammer everything to death and insert the most minute, uninteresting, and unimportant things into the conversation. That, and that the, the, the problem with that is it brings you away from the main point. It brings you away from the main mission. And he, num, he, uh, he uh, speaks about four of them. Foolish controversies. You know... This is something that's gone on from the beginning of the, uh, of the church and will go on to, to the end, you know. Foolish kind of controversies. In the Middle Ages, you know, uh, the monks used to discuss how many angels can stand on the head of a pen. Really? Guys? You know, those kinds of, of ideas which which you might say they're not necessarily anything wrong. I mean, maybe we could make a determination about how many angels could stand on the head of a pin, but is it really important? And is it important to, to, uh, to engage in those kinds of discussions which will bring us away? And, often, and this happens in the church, too. Now, we have not had a discussion on standing angels on the head of a pen. But in, in our modern era, all kinds of social discussions get brought into the doors of the church. All kinds of political discussions get, get, uh, get brought into the church. Not that there's... Any, not, anything wrong with having political opinions or social ideas. But they tend to, and we see it in, in many churches today, bring them away from the track of the gospel so that all kinds of things are important except the important thing that we're talking about Christmas time here, that Jesus came to do something to save this rotten humanity in this world and so there were were uh, uh, there foolish controversies genealogies this was probably more particular to the jewish crowd that was in the early church you know they were proud of the, their genealogies and and that could cut both ways i mean it's it's nice to know where you come from but if you if where you're coming from is a divisive thing then then it has no place in the church. And they were, they were even going beyond that. They were even going beyond saying, well, I'm a, a true son of God because I'm from the tribe of Judah and this is all of my grandfathers and great-grandfathers. They were also, in those days, making up fantastic allegorical ideas out of the genealogies. You know, they would read them and then they would make up stories about these people. Uh, kind of reminds you a little bit, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I will, of the, you know, a lot of the Roman Catholic mythology. You know, they take a, a person and then they, they, invent, they, in, uh, they invent circumstances around them. True or not, the fact is, does it belong in the church? Is it bringing us forward or is it diluting the truth of the message. And so Paul warns about people who are doing, bringing foolish controversies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. Now there's great discussions about the law, 
But there was also, from the Jewish side again, great dissensions and unimportant things like how many steps can you take on the Sabbath? Can you wear your hat on the Sabbath? Can you, and, and the, 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 the list goes on and on. I'm not going to quote you all these old Jewish controversies that were going on. And in Crete, apparently already, they were beginning to crowd into the church. And the Apostle Paul says, avoid those. He doesn't say you don't have to know anything about them, but he says, look, some things are time. Uh, the way I'm taking this, it's, it's, he's saying, some things are really just time wasters. You know, you have better things to do as the people of God. And don't let these people crowd into that. Avoid all of these kinds of controversies because he says they're unprofitable and worthless. They don't bring us forward as a church. They don't get us doing what we need to do as the people of God. I mean, uh, let me just make a small application. Be careful of the internet in this day because you can engage in a multitude of con controversies and and discussions and, and things and, and, uh, that will just suck your time dry for the things that you really need to be doing. Now, I mean, if God calls you to a ministry of confronting people on some of these websites and then getting out, that's all right. But it's, it doesn't, Paul's saying there's a sinkhole here that can happen to you as the people of God. You can get drugged down into this. Don't do that. Secondly, he says, uh, the second group of people who are out to destroy the people are the people who are dividing the church. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Paul is, is quite strong in his language here. You know, that one of the as we read in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, one of the marks of the church is its unity in Jesus. Now, I would say unity around the gospel, okay? Not just unity in, in a sort of, well, everybody who says anything about Jesus. But if you look at Ephesians, he clearly makes out one baptism, one Lord, one faith, you know. And he talks about unity of the Spirit in that. But unfortunately... There are those who may not be believers. And their, their particular niche in life is to stir up trouble and to divide people. And we probably all, if we're old enough, we've all experienced that at different times in churches where things, people got divided over not the gospel, but just things that had happened in the church. And Paul says it's the duty of a good church, you know, not only to not get involved in all these peripheral issues, but also to have nothing more to do with people who are there just to destroy the unity of the body of Christ, the truth of the gospel, the working together for the lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the bad team here that Paul describes. He goes on to describe, though, at the end of this, the good team as well. And that's what I'm taking out of the beginning there at verse 12. He says, When I send Artemis or Tychius to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that you, they lack nothing. And so he said, okay, you got, on the, you got on this one side the people who are wasting their time on insignificant or dividing the people, trying to cause division. On the other side, you have people who are doing something for the kingdom. You have guys that are mentioned here like uh, Artemis and Tychius. They, 
they have a, a mention, Tychius is mentioned in, in another one of the scriptures. These were Paul's co-workers. And what I would like you to notice too is that, that they were allowing their lives to be moved around a little bit like chess pieces. That's what it takes to be sometimes to be a successful part of the work of God in this world is you allow your life. I mean, Paul's not even saying, well, you know, you know, I'm going to consult with these guys and see if they want, want to come down there to Crete. He's going to say, no, I'm going to send either Artemis or Tychius. They're coming down there. And then you're coming up here to Nicopolis and you're going to spend the winter for, with me here working and, and, and fellowshipping in this place. And, and uh, maybe that doesn't seem like much, but when you think of the enormity of that, you know, being sent here and there for the sake of the gospel, that's really kind of sometimes out of our comfort zone, isn't it? You know, to say, God, I'm willing to, I want to be a part of what you're doing in the kingdom. And it doesn't matter how or where you want to use me, or where, how, where you want to send me, or when, I'm willing to do that. And we see Paul had a team of guys around him like that. And that was, he was teaching the church, this is what your responsibility is. One, to be able to be moved around by God according to his will. To be part of a team that's going somewhere doing something even if it impacts your life personally in a way that you had not anticipated before. And then secondly there, he, he tells them, and, and you need to support this. I mean, this statement here in verse 13, do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. Uh, that maybe is not a blatant statement of, of uh, give them money <laughs> that they need, but, but that's really in reality what it was, wasn't it? He says, you guys are stable. You're there in Crete. You have your lives, your, your businesses, your opportunities, and, but that all, all is not just for you. That's for the advance of the kingdom. And in this particular case, these two guys, uh, Zenos and Apollos. Now, Zenos, we don't know anything about except that to, to say as an aside that I guess there can be some good lawyers in the world because uh, here we have Zenos, and he's obviously a good on the right team, right? Uh, we don't know anything about him, but Apollos, of course, had been a great evangelist. And uh, even before he understood the gospel, he was going around preaching about John's uh, uh, redem John's uh, prophetic work and then he found out about Jesus and he got right in the groove and, and he was there uh, on and on and, and uh, it became a great order and preacher in the church and God said to the people of Crete part of your teamwork is to make sure that the team can go forward wherever God's sending them may not be you going forward somewhere, but there's always someone going forward somewhere in the kingdom. And it's, it's up to you to make sure they are able to get it done. That's the, 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 the description I'm seeing here of, of, of what, what's, what's kind of winding down here, Okay. Paul's kind of putting a choice before the churches there in Crete. He said, you know, are you going to be the time wasters, the dividers in this life? Or are you going to be on the team that is going forward, doing whatever God wants done, supporting that, paying for it even, to, to get the gospel branching out into the world there? And here we come 2,000 years later. It's still the same. We still are faced with the same choice in our Christian life. Are we going to be the time wasters and the dividers? Or are we going to be the ones that are on board with the work, teamwork of the kingdom? And we're going to open up our pocketbooks when necessary and pay for it 
as God sends the gospel out to the world. Because we're all encompassed in the same faith. Verse 15 says, All of you who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. You know, these weren't people who were like. I mean, they came from different language groups. They came from different cultural settings. They came from different backgrounds in, in their lives. Some were slaves. Some had been free. Some had been soldiers. Some had been uh, craftsmen. The church was full of all kinds of different people. But they could unite around the purpose of the church because they were all in the one faith. They had their mind, minds focused on the Lord Jesus and on what his, what, what his desires and his kingdom was about in this world. And that's where, where Paul kind of lands the ship, the, lands the, the plane it, it, or whatever here at the end of the book here, right? Get leadership in your church. Love one another. Live well with one another in the congregation. Live outwardly in a gospel-oriented way in your society and make sure at the end of the day, even inside the church, you're on the right team. You're on the team that's going somewhere for Jesus. And that's how he ends his, his discussion here for Titus. Let's pray. Thank you, Father in heaven, for the admonitions and the encouragements and the great gospel sense that we get having read this letter from Paul to Titus and how much that effective working is in our hearts this morning too. And we do want to uh, be on the right team that's going forward, it's doing what needs to be done and, and that is supplying the needs of the urgent needs that need to be taken care of. For you have so richly blessed us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.